All right, so this passage, we are going to start going through this verse by verse. There's, only, there's pretty, uh, pretty much only one thing going on in this, one main thing going on in this passage, and it has to do with Caleb. And Caleb kind of going, going to Joshua and just saying, look, I want my inheritance that was given unto me. We've seen before where they're divvying up the inheritance by lot to the different tribes. And now Caleb's saying, you know what? I get a special inheritance because I wholly follow the Lord my God. But let's just start reading here because that's basically what this is about. And we're going to go back and we're going to look back at when the spies were sent out to spy out the land before the 40 years of roaming in the wilderness and everything else that followed as a result of their lack of faith in the Lord. But let's start here in verse number one. The Bible says, And these are the countries which are the children which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for an inheritance to them. By lot was there an inher inher inheritance as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and in half on the other side Jordan, but under the Levites he gave none inheritance among them. So this is just a real brief overview. Obviously, there's nine and a half tribes left to give inheritance to on this side, Jordan, because the other ones already received their inheritance, even from Moses, before they crossed over um, the Jordan River. So, and then it mentions that the Levites don't get an inheritance of land. And I'm going to cover that in a couple weeks. There's, a, there's chapter 18, I believe it is, is when I'm going to cover that, because there's multiple reasons that are given, and we've already seen... Um, a couple reasons from previous chapters. And now even here it says, for the children of Joseph were two tribes, verse number four. And that's, you know, this is one of the reasons he didn't give the Levites inheritance because the, the children of Joseph were so large and so massive that they were being given inheritance each. So I don't want to get too much more involved in that because we'll cover that in, uh, in future weeks. Manasseh and Ephraim will continue verse 4. Therefore they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. Verse number 5. As the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Now, it's interesting. I've mentioned this before, but just as we keep going week after week, when we talk about Moses and we talk about Joshua, we see a common theme. As the Lord said, so they did. As God told Moses, so he did. As the Lord instructed Joshua, so he did. And that is something that is a very strong character trait. And it's something that we ought to be striving for and looking to as our examples of saying, hey, whatever God is going to say for us in our lives, whatever we see in the Bible, that is what we should be doing. And, and would to God it could be said of you and of me, hey, I know that person. And whatever it was that the Bible said, that's what they did. That's how they lived their life. That's what marked their life. And if you just keep going back in history and look at all the things they did, well, whatever it was that the Lord said to do, that's what they did. That's who Moses and Joshua, that's how they're, they're described as. Now, we know they're not perfect, and we're not perfect either. But I'll tell you what, this, this, <laughs> this phrase keeps coming up an awful lot in the Holy Word of God. Very good, very good way to be known. And that's what we should be striving for. Look at verse number six. The Bible says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee, and Kadesh Barnea. Now, keep your place here in Joshua 14. Turn, if you would, back to Deuteronomy chapter number one. Because we're going to go look at the thing that the Lord said unto Caleb and unto Joshua and Kadesh Barnea. And just and, and see what that is, because Joshua is made or uh, Caleb's making reference to this. So let's go check it out. Because if you remember that when the spies were sent out, there was one person chosen of all of the twelve tribes to go out and spy out the land and check it out. So the children of Israel, they were delivered out of Egypt. And God, you know, there, there's a great um, victory coming out of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and all these great miracles and God's protecting them and keeping them safe and he's leading them towards the promised land that was going to be their inheritance. So as they're on their way to go and inherit the land, which is what the book of Joshua is about, 40 years earlier they were about to do everything that's happening in the book of Joshua. 
So as they're about to go in there, they say, hey, wouldn't it be a good thing to do? It would be wise to go check out the land. Let's go check it out. We'll, have, we'll be able to make a good plan, a good strategy to go in there and, and, you know, and, and take over this land. So they go in, they send these 12 spies to go in and spy out the land and check it out. And they go in and they, they, they look it out, they scope it out, they bring back some of the fruit. And they're like, wow, it's a great place. It's you know, well watered and it, it's a land of milk and honey. And there, you know, there's all these buildings and everything's there. It's basically this prime place, pristine for them to go and to move into and to take it for, for God to bless them with such a great land. But the people got scared, 10 of them, except for Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua said, no, let's do this. If God's with us, you know, God before us, who could be against us? That was their mindset. But everyone else was saying, no, no, no. Like, it was, it was back to that same mentality that we see all throughout those 40 years of the children of Israel wandering in Egypt. In the, excuse me, not in Egypt, in the, in, the, in the wilderness, in the wilderness of sin. They're going out and they're wandering because they had this attitude of saying, oh, what did God bring us all the way out of Egypt just to kill us here? Oh, what, we're going to go in here and we're going to die because there's these giants here and, and they're so well fortified and they're stronger than us and they're bigger than us and, you know, they're just going to kill us. And that was the attitude, this fearful attitude and not trusting in the Lord. But see, Joshua and Caleb both had that faith and were saying, no, no, let's go do this. So as a result of that, God, was gonna, God blessed both of them. Because everybody else in their generation, their people, they all died in the wilderness. That's why they wandered for 40 years, because God said, okay, you think I'm not going to give this to you? I'm not going to give it to you, basically, not in your lifetime. And your children, who you thought were never going to make it into the promised land, well, guess what? They are going to go in and receive it. You thought they're all going to die. You thought we're all gonna, you're all going to get slaughtered in battle. But no, I'm going to show you, you're going to wander around the wilderness until that generation dies out and then your children are going to go and inherit it. But he allowed for Joshua and Caleb from that generation to go in because they were right with God. So now we're going to see here, look at verse number 35 of Deuteronomy 1, what it is that God said concerning Caleb and Joshua. Look at verse number 35, the Bible says, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. As the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither, but Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. So this is what God said concerning Caleb and Joshua and Moses, because we see in there too that Moses, or the Lord was angry with Moses because of the children of Israel that, that were complaining and, and going this way. And Moses ended up not being able to go into the land either. And, um, but Caleb was. But specifically with Caleb, God says, to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon. So when they sent in the spies to spy out the land, they, they went to this place that we're reading about here, the place of the Anakims, which is Hebron or Kirjath Arba. It was called Kirjath Arba when they went in there to go and, and spy out the land. And of course, it's renamed to Hebron after, after they take it over and, and everything. So, but but. That's the land that they specifically saw. They brought back the great fruit and they're like, oh man, this place is great. That good report. Because Joshua's heart was right, God said, I'm going to give you that land. That specific land, and which was a good land. It was well watered, it was well fort. You know, there's, there's so many good things about that land. And that was 40 years, or 45 years earlier. And Joshua's like, or I mean, Caleb's like, I still remember that. I want that land. I want, God, God promised that to me, and he's kept me alive all the way until now. I want that mountain. And that's, and, and this is, I love this story. It's a great story. And Joshua's 80, or excuse me, Caleb is 85 years old. 85 years old going, I want that mountain. 
Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. I just preached recently on getting your heart right with God and, and how everything starts with your heart. And that's what was right about Caleb. That was the biggest thing that was right about Caleb. It was in his heart. He was a man who had a lot of heart to serve the Lord. He's a man who, who, who had his heart in it and, and was so dedicated and so faithful that he didn't let the thought of a formidable adversary, a formidable foe, scare him or cause him to doubt or cause him to back down or run away or get scared or quit. No, he kept pushing forward and said, we can do this. God is with us. As it, you know, you don't have to turn there, but in Numbers 13, this is, this is what Caleb's answer was because when he went and this 10 brethren are over there, the other heads of the tribes are saying, no, no, we shouldn't go in there. The Bible says in Numbers 13, 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. He says, we are well able to do this. What they saw was chariots. They saw big defenses. They saw giants. And we're going to get into that a little bit later real soon, but that the land was full of giants and, and, and a very strong, mighty people. But so when, when 10 out of the 12 saw that, they're like, no, this is no good. We're going to get killed. We're going to get destroyed. But when Joshua saw that, he said, let's just do it. So let's go up at once and possess it. Let's just get up there. We'll go. We'll do it. We are well able to overcome it. Not, I think we can do it. If we, if we have this special plan, if we do this, I think we can do it. He said, nope, we're well able to do this. Let's go. Why? Because he wasn't trusting in his own might. He wasn't trusting in his own strength. He wasn't just thinking, you know what? I've been working out and lifting weights and I've got my armor and I am just ready to go and I could kill anybody. He wasn't just like proud and arrogant. His heart was right with God. He's already seen the miracles that God had done in their lives. He knew that God was with them. If God's able to deliver them out of the bondage of Egypt, God can deliver them and give them anything God wants. And Caleb full well knew that, as did Joshua. And they didn't let anything back them up or slow them down. They were able to do this. Let's keep reading here in Joshua chapter 14 because I'm gonna, we're going to finish up basically with this passage. And then I want to get into just a few more things and other references to this story. Uh, verse number 8, the Bible says, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. Now, I wasn't even, have this in my notes, but it's important to note this. The way that you live your life and walk and your attitude and your heart being in it, you're either going to be a great encouragement and edify and strengthen other people, or you're going to bring them down and make them fear because fear is contagious but so is confidence fear but fear is even more contagious fear is 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 worse you know, a little leaven leaven at the whole lump you get a little sin involved and stuff and all of a sudden you, you've got a big problem you add a little bit of fear you know these people they came in with this bad attitude and this evil report no god's not going to be able to save us god's not going to be able to protect us Watch your own attitude because that will spread to other people. It's so important to have our hearts right with God and just and, and full on having faith that He could protect us and not doubt and not waver. There will be hard times in your life and choices that you have to make. People go through it all the time. People in our church have already been going through this. And honestly, this is what defines your life are the hard choices that you make. What you choose to do and how you choose to live defines your entire life and your being and your essence being here on this earth. You choosing to follow the Lord, let that define you. Don't back out. Don't back down. 
Don't let f whoever, family, friends, so anyone, you'll people, because it's the random stranger you're probably not going to care about. It's going to be the attacks coming from people close to you that are going to be the biggest, that could be the biggest foes. And the strongest adversary are the ones that, that you might be close with. But we all have to decide for ourselves where, where does your loyalty ultimately lie? And I'm not saying we shouldn't be loyal to family, but, I'm, but I am saying we ought to be more loyal to God than to anybody, than to any human being. God deserves that more than anyone. Maintain the loyalty to Him first. If there's no reason to have problems with your family, then great, stick with your family. You know, be good to them and, do, and, and have a close family as you ought to. But don't let other people corrupt or bring you down from serving the Lord so that you can say, whatsoever the Lord commanded, that's what I'm doing. People will see when you start, uh, and I'll speak perfectly from it by example. I'd visited many churches after I'd gotten saved. And, you know, I'm not going to make an excuse for not getting plugged into churches. I should have. It's my responsibility, it was, and, and I should have done it. But when I finally got involved in a church where I can see somebody serving the Lord, and not only preaching what the Bible says, but actually living and following and leading by example and doing the things that you could see in Scripture, that was really encouraging. That really got me motivated. That got me stirred up. That got me right with God. And that got me doing way more. Why? Because I was able to see the confidence, the attitude. God's with us. Who could be against us? Let's go and do this work. It's exciting. But then you go into to, you know, all these other churches and they're scared of their own shadow. Oh, I don't know, the government's going to do this. The sodomites are going to do this. We're going to have people come after us. You know, and it's fearful. Or they're just not teaching anything. But when you have somebody that's willing to just dedicate their life, saying, no, we're doing this, that'll rub off on people. It'll keep you right and you'll be, without even realizing it sometimes, you'll be helping many other people. Just showing up and attending church on a regular basis is helpful. I mean, that's, and that's a very small thing. But it's something that you just determine and say, this is important to me. I'm going to make sure I'm there. And, and many people, I think, will never realize even for pastors, the importance of just, of just people showing up and being in church. That is edifying. That is helpful. That strengthens us to keep going and to keep pushing and doing more. But when, no, when, when people's heart isn't in it, that's contagious. And many other people's heart might start to melt like Joshua said, that the children of Israel, their heart melted. Because of the evil report brought on by the other people. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. So again, reiterating, that's what God said about Caleb. Or that, that Mo, excuse me, Moses said from God to Caleb that he was going to get that land, which also goes to show, you know, if you dedicate your life and you wholly follow the Lord, God's going to have a great blessing for you. He's going to have a great inheritance. There's going to be great rewards for you in heaven. Remember that this promised land is symbolic of, of heaven, of, of the kingdom to come. It's entering into that rest, entering into the promised land that we will one day enter into with the Lord Jesus Christ, where we will receive rewards and a blessing and an inheritance 
as, as Caleb is receiving his inheritance, you know, physically on this earth, it, sim it symbolizes what we can receive too. The best of the land is reserved for the people who wholly follow the Lord their God and who can serve the Lord even in bad conditions. Don't forget Caleb was wandering around in the wilderness also with all the rest of the children of Israel, not having a, a steady place, kind of roaming around, going from one place to the place, and, and being among the people that continued to complain and murmur and God sending fires and pestilence and other things among them and the, the, the serpents because of their disobedience. And Caleb is spending decade after decade around these people, yet maintaining his heart and his faith right with God the whole way to the point to when he's 85 years old, he's still able to say, God promised that to me. He hasn't lost sight of the end game. He's kept that faith the whole time. Even when it was difficult, even when 40 years seemed like it was going to be an eternity. I mean, think about it. for me, it's like a lifetime. I'm 41 years old. I've just been around for just over 40 years. So someone telling me now, hey, in 40 years, that's a situation Joshua was in. In 40 years. He was 40 years old. And God said, in 40 years, I'll give you that land. That's when you're going to go. And he stuck with it year after year after year, decade after decade, stayed true and, and still maintained such a great faith. What a great example. Verse number 10, and now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. 85, it's still hard to imagine. And look what he says in verse number 11. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for, for war, both to go out and to come in. So you see that phrase, going out, to go out and coming in. That's, refer that's a reference to people going out to war and then returning back home again and not just going out and dying in the field. You go out and to come in. I could go out. I could fight. I mean, how many 85-year-old men do you know right now that could say, you know what? 45 years ago when I was 40 years old, I'm just as fit as I was then to go out and fight now and fight a battle, go out and come back in. Praise God. What a, and you know why? Because his heart was right. His attitude was right. He never gave up. He didn't let the years that were going by and him aging stop him from getting out of the fight. He stayed with it. Don't let anything get you out. Physical impairments, age, whatever. You can do it. You can serve the Lord. The only way you're going to fail is when you quit, when you give up. When you roll over and die. Caleb wasn't ready to roll over and die. He still realized there's a lot more battles to be fought. That we saw that the Lord told Joshua. He told Joshua, you're old. And there's a lot more to do. Caleb understood that and he's like, let's go. <laughs> All right, amen. 85 years old. Let's go out and fight. And not just fight. Let's fight the most difficult battle that's probably going to exist of this, of this whole conquest. I want to fight the hardest one. I'm ready to go. Put me on the front line. Let's go in and do it. That was Caleb's attitude. And that's why he had such a great inheritance. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me, then I will be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Again, proving. His confidence is not in his flesh, even though he feels like I'm just as strong as I was 45 years ago. He feels up to the fight. Physically, he feels fit. He's saying, well, if the Lord will be with me, of course I'll be able to drive them out. He's not trusting in his flesh. He's not trusting in his own ability and skill. He's trusting in God, just as he did 45 years earlier, because he knew that God can win the victory. 
and he knows even now an 85 year old man can still be used of God to bring a great victory. And he says, if God's going to be with me, then even I can do this. And that's the attitude we all need to have. Verse 13, and Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Now, I'll give you a little bit of information here about Arba and Anak and the Anakims. So, when you see words in general in the Bible that are like Anna Kim that end with an I am. The I am is typically just a plural form of the word. I'm not going to say every single time without fail, but generally you're going to see that like seraphim is a seraph. There's a seraph and seraphim. And those are like angelic beings, right? Uh, uh, other heavenly creatures or cherubims, right? You have a cherub and cherubim is the, is the plural form. You have Baal, you have Baalim, right? Baalim is like multiple devils, false gods, Baal, right? So here the Anakims are basically the, the descendants of Anak, or, or um, yeah, Anak. So they're Anakims. And of course the Anakims are named after Anak, but Arba is the father of Anak. He's the one, the progenitor of Anak, who, who spawned the Anakims. In Joshua chapter 15, verse number 13, just on the next page there, the Bible says, And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. So that's where we see, um, in Joshua 14, it says, Arba was a great man among the Anakim. So he was, he was a great leader, a great man. But then we see that he was actually the father of Anak, who, of course, is the father of the Anakims. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13, we're going to see the sons of Anak, or the, the Anakims referenced again in Numbers 13. And this is where we're going to see that they were giants, that the, the, the Anakims were actually giants. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 21 is what we're going to start looking at here. The Bible says in Numbers 13, verse 21, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. So they're bringing this great big cluster of grapes that they were bearing on a staff between the two of them. Like they're carrying this, this, this big cluster just because... I mean, it had to be pretty large for them to even transport it that way, right? I mean, it, normally, I know we had grapes growing in Prescott Valley, and you'd get some pretty decent-sized clusters, but, I mean, you, you're picking it up with, with one hand. They, uh, this, this just goes to show how fruitful the land was just to have, like, this, this huge, great, big cluster of grapes that they're carrying between the two of them back. And this is the land, don't forget, this is the land that's promised unto Caleb because of his faithfulness. So they're coming back. They've got, they've got pomegranates. They've got figs. They've got all this fruit of the land. And it says in verse 24, the place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching out, searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel into the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. 
So the first report is that the land itself is very, very good. I mean, milk, honey, this great fruit. But then it says in verse 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. So he's talking about, now they're starting to talk about their great defenses. You know, they've got these big walls. They're built up. How are we even going to defeat these people? I mean, they could just sit in there. You know, there, there's no way to, to fight these people. And then it says, um, And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. So now they're specifically making mention of the children of Anak because they had a reputation of being, you know, big and strong and they were giants. So they're these, these really large people. Verse 29, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. See, Caleb had his, had his mind on God's strength being with them, whereas the, children, the other people that went up with him are thinking their own physical strength. See, we can't think that way. You can't think about your own physical abilities if you want to serve the Lord. Perfect example of this, hopefully it's very applicable of saying, well, I don't think I can really preach the gospel to anyone because I'm really shy and I'm not good with words and I can't speak really well. If you're going to go out in your own strength, you're, you're right. You're not good enough. If you're going to trust in your own ability to serve God, then it's not going to go anywhere. You're not going to be successful. But if you could go out and say, Lord, I'm here. You made me the way that I am. You know who I am. I need help with this, but I'm here to serve you and to do what you've commanded me to do. I'm willing to go. There's someone that God can do a lot with. There's someone that can lead people to Christ. You let God do all the hard work, but you put yourself out there for him. You yield yourself to him. Use me, Lord. I'm here. Help me, help me do this. I'm willing. My heart is in it. And you just do it. Bottom line. And then God can use you and mold you and shape you the way that he wants you to be. But your heart has to be there. These people, they're looking at themselves saying, oh, we're weak. Yeah, we are weak, but he's strong. Verse 32, And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto, unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. Great stature means they're very tall. They're very tall people. And then it says in verse 33, And, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. A little bit of an exaggeration there, but what they're trying to get across is that, you know, these people are so tall, we're just like little puny people compared to them because they are so tall. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We see a couple other mentions of giants in the Bible. And I brought this up a few weeks ago. We don't believe in what's these days commonly known as the Nephilim. Even though it's just the Hebrew word for giants, we do believe that giants existed, they're real, and the Bible talks about them. But we don't have to add any air of mystery by calling them by a name in another language. Because that's what fools do. That's what people, or people who are proud. Or people who are just easily deceived and carried about with every wind of doctrine. That want to feel like they know something extra special, some hidden occult knowledge that you don't know. And go to extra biblical resources other than just looking at what the Bible actually says about these people who are the giants. They're giants in the land in those days. And we believe that. And they're not hybrids between human and angels and, 
and all this weird stuff and they didn't grow to be I forget how tall how many hundred or thousands of feet tall whatever remember when I brought that up like the the book of Enoch says and the book of Jasher and all those these these non-inspired books that are written of men claiming that these giants are so incredibly tall that's not the way it was but the Bible gives us examples so in 1st Samuel 17 we have the example of Goliath Goliath was a giant everyone knows this story David and Goliath Goliath was a Nephilim <laughs> he was a giant but guess what David didn't have to sling the stone you know 100 stories into the air <laughs> to try to, to try to knock him out and kill him okay that's not what happened but the Bible actually gives us dimension so we don't even have to wonder about it we don't have to question it. We don't have to go to the book of Enoch to figure out how big giants were because the Bible tells us how big they were. 1 Samuel 17, verse number 4, the Bible says, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. So right there, it tells us how tall was Goliath. He's a giant. He's a man of war. He's not an infant. He's not a baby giant. I mean, he's a, he's a full-grown man giant. And his height is six cubits and a span. You say, yeah, but Pastor Burns, I don't know what a cubit or a span is. It's actually very simple. A cubit is from your elbow to your fingers. Now, I know that we all are a little bit different size and shape, but in general, the standard would be roughly 18 inches, about a foot and a half. That's a cubit. Okay, and, that, and that's just, we're just going to use that number because as we've done before, ultimately a few inches here or there isn't going to matter. One or two inches is not going to make some huge change in our calculation because if he's six cubits, what's that going to be? Three, six, nine feet, right? Nine feet tall. And then a span. What's a span? A span is the distance from your th the tip of your thumb to the tip of your little finger. That would be a span. And these are older measurements that we don't use, but they've gone throughout time. And that is about um, nine inches. That's kind of the standard that's used. Okay? So... Goliath was approximately nine foot nine inches tall. It's a tall guy. But is that really outside of the realm of possibility to even think that there could be a man that's nine foot nine inches tall today? No. Now, I don't remember. I, I, didn't, I didn't look it up. I've seen it multiple times, like the tallest recorded living man in, like in, in, in modern history and even the tallest person alive today. But I mean, people even in our time, have grown over eight feet tall. So we're talking nine foot nine inches, right? This isn't just, uh, this isn't 20 stories tall, okay? This, this, is, this is a normal person, but someone who is a giant, someone who is big. You, me, I'm six foot two, saying next to someone who's, you know, nine foot nine, that's pretty intimidating. That's not someone I want to get in a fight with. <laughs> you're going to be like, yeah, I could take that guy. And you walk in and you're like, you see that giant? No. I don't want to fight you because it's, I mean, everything about him is going to be a little bit bigger, right? He's going to have bigger, bigger arms, bigger hands, bigger muscles. Goliath was approximately nine foot nine inches tall. It's a big guy. Let's read a little bit more about him. Verse number five, it says, And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So again, we have more measurements. You say, I don't know what a shekel is. Well, that's fine. I did the conversion for you before I, before I uh, preached tonight, and that's about 125 pounds. So... 125 pounds may be kind of hard to figure out. Now, it's, it's, it's hanging on him. So this is his armor, right? It's a, it's a coat of mail. 
So it's metal. He's got, he's got like brass metal. He's got this, this around his body to prevent him from getting stabbed and getting, you know, uh, hurt and injured in, in a war, in a battle. And, but 125 pounds is a lot of weight to be carrying around yourself. I went backpacking once and we, we all weighed our packs because I had a lot of stuff. So we're going on a weekend trip, but I, I always like to have like the, like the best stuff when we go out camping and, and my roughing it. I, I like having good meals and stuff. So as a result, my backpack was really heavy. I think I had like the heaviest pack of the group and that was like 50 pounds. And that's pretty heavy. Now the pack was nice, it, you know, it's, it's, it's designed to kind of distribute some of the weight and everything else, but that's only 50 pounds. And that was heavy and I wasn't having to fight anybody, right? I'm able to kind of walk and, and hold on to it and hike and take breaks and stuff. I'm not looking to get in a fight with a 50 pound back, you know, backpack on my back. That's gonna be a hindrance. Now, obviously, armors could be a little bit different. You're not, you don't have to carry or anything, but still, it's a lot of weight. Just demonstrating, you know, his strength because he's so big, it has to be bigger weight. It has to weigh more to cover his body, just the, the surface area to cover him. And he's big enough and strong enough that that's not going to slow him down. That's actually a benefit for him to have that as a defense. And because of his might and because of how big he is, I'm sure it could be a little bit thicker and a little bit bigger which makes him even more of an adversary, even, even stronger of a foe, because he's got stronger defenses. He's able to carry more. He's got a stronger might. And that's what it says his, his spear, it says the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, I don't know exactly what a weaver's beam is, but it's just a tool used for you know, weaving. But you gotta figure, it's a decent sized spool, decent sized diameter, in order for it to even be making mention that it's like a weaver's beam, right? So he's going to have bigger hands. And instead of kind of like the normal grip that we would have for a spear, his grip is that much bigger, which means that the, the staff is going to be fit for his hand. And it says that the, the spear head, where the spear comes together, makes that head and it's, you know, it's um, fastened to the front of the, of the beam. It says it was 600 shekels of iron. That's about 15 pounds. Significant weight for the head of a spear. I mean, you find, have you ever seen like those arrowheads and stuff from, you know, those things weigh very little. Now, now granted, it's for an arrow, but even spearheads, they're not going to weigh that much. 15 pounds is pretty, pretty significant. So this is just all going to demonstrate what, what type of a big person this is that David is facing. And then, of course, he had an armor bearer before him, someone bearing a shield. So not only does he have his weapon, and his, his mail coat and everything, he's got a guy in front of him to help, you know, dodge all the attacks that are coming his way too. This is what David was faced with. We see one more illustration. We're going to come back to Samuel 17. So say in Sam, uh, 1 Samuel 17, with Og, the king of Bashan, the children of Israel already fought a giant. Now, not a whole bunch of them. But the, it says in Deuteronomy 3.11, it says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. So it's talking about his bed, his bed frame, right? Where he laid down. That was 13 feet 6 inches and uh, long by 6 feet wide. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean he was 13 foot 6 inches tall because usually your bed is going to be made larger than your body, right? You're going to have room to kind of stretch out and lay out and have your arms up or whatever. So you, you got to figure though, this is still pretty close to probably Goliath's size. He had a bed to fit him and, and, and be able to do that, but it's just saying, man, that his bed frame was 13 and a half feet long. These are the measurements that we get in Scripture. They're actual, literal measurements from the Word of God. No reason to believe in what you'll find on the internet of the Nephilim, of these creatures that were however big they're trying to claim they were. Even if they're claiming they're 20 feet. Okay, we don't see any evidence of that in Scripture whatsoever. But 9 feet, 10 feet, sure. And that lines up even with what we could see today. But think about, I mean, you think about what 
that person is. And, and there's a few people in the Bible that had the heart for the fight, that had the heart and the faith and the trust in God, that were willing to fight any foe, any adversary. Caleb is one of them. Caleb saw the land of giants, not just one. He saw a bunch of them. He's saying, there's the Anakims, and they've got the best of the land. And you can figure, they probably did have the, be the actual best of the land. Why? Because they were the strongest and mightiest. And if they came in and said, no, we're living here, there probably weren't many people that were going to say, no, that's my place. They're probably going to say, okay, you have that. I'm going to go over here because this place is pretty good too. I, li I like that town over there. You guys can stay here. But Caleb saw that and he says, I want this land. If God's going to fight my battles for me, then let's pick the best place, the hardest place. That's what I want. Why not? If God's backing you up, go for it. Go for the most. Don't go for something small. Shoot for the stars. But the heart that he had is the same heart that David had. When Goliath presented himself, to the children of Israel. And he's, and he's mocking God. And he's standing up and saying, you know, send out someone to fight with me, you know, if you're able to. And he's defying the Lord. They're all scared. Not even, not even the king, Saul. Anointed of God. Who's God, God's already helped him win victories. And Saul, don't forget, he was head and shoulders above the rest when he was anointed king. He was, he, was, he was the tallest guy. If you're just looking at physical height and stature, he would have been the one to go. Why not? He was the king. If the Lord's going to be with anyone, wouldn't he be the Lord's anointed? Hey, go out there and fight this guy and don't let him, you know, mock God like that. You show him who the Lord is. And God will be with you and you could win that fight. But he, even he was afraid to go. But David, whose heart was right with God, comes down. And he's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You're going to let him talk like that? And then he goes, and look at this. Look at verse number 42. When David gets all ready to go, they're trying to put armor on himself. He's like, get this stuff off me. I haven't tried this. I, you know, like, like, let me just fight this battle. It's the Lord's anyways. You don't have to give me all this stuff now and get me ready. Like, it's, you know, let me just do my thing. And he pulls his, his stones out of the brook. Nice, smooth stones he used with his sling. And, and when Goliath sees him, this is where we're catching up in the story. Look at verse number 42. It says, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. So he hates him. He's like... For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Now, on the one hand, we had Caleb. He's an old man. He's 85 years old. And on the other hand, we have David, who's a youth. And he, at this point, he's not a man of war. He's a youth. He's got a fair countenance. You know, he's kind of good looking. He hasn't been in battle. He's got all these scars and stuff and all these fights. It's just this, this young guy coming against this, this war veteran, Goliath. And Goliath's like, who are you sending out to fight against me? But that shows you his disdain for him. Who was David? Was David trusting in his own strength and his own might? No. But was God able to use David to bring down a giant? Absolutely. Verse number 43, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his God, by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Goliath came to him in his, in his strength and in his might and trying to intimidate him and trying to scare him. And David came back saying, you know what? I'm coming in the name of the Lord. You're going to see how powerful God is today. He didn't say you're going to see how powerful David is today and how smart and cunning I am. You're going to see what the Lord can do. 
You're going to see the battles that God can fight, whom you're defying. Verse number 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our, our hands. Sorry, my notes got a little bit out of order here. He's giving the credit unto God. We need to remember to do that. You're faced with a spiritual battle or some, some great adversary standing in your way. Don't be intimidated by it. In fact, look at the attitude that David had. Instead of being intimidated or even being hesitant or being scared, I love this about him because it's the same exact attitude that Caleb had. Look at verse number 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted. That means he hurried up. He didn't drag his feet and going, well, I guess I'll do this. You know, God's got me doing this battle. I guess I'll go out and fight. Hopefully he's with me. I'm going to go out in there and, and see what I can do. I'll give it my best, I guess. No, it says David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He's like, all right, let's do this. Come on. You know, he's, and he's, he's on it. He's going. That's the attitude that David had. That's the attitude that Caleb had. It doesn't matter how strong the foe was. He's saying, if God's with us, let's go and do this. Let's get it done. Let's go out and win some souls. Let's go out and fight these battles. I'm not backing down to anybody. Let's do it. Bring the world against us. We're going to do it. And this is the attitude that we're going to need to have going into end times going into troubles, great tribulation such as was not before the world began, nor no, nor ever shall be. Hard times to come, giants coming up to face us and to stop the work of the Lord being done. We need to stand up and fight and not only just stand our ground, but hey, let's run into the battle. <laughs> let's do it. Why? Because God will be with us. Not because we're so great, because God's so great. And God can win the victory 100 times over. Doesn't matter. And of course, we see, we'll finish up this story, uh, verse number 49. David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. That's all they needed to see. See, this one battle, this one victory, David not being afraid, not backing down, not being intimidated, changed the whole course of the whole war, the whole battle, everything. This one victory, then they went in and just destroyed him. We need Joshua's. We need Caleb's. We need David's. We need Jonathan's. Jonathan had the same spirit as David. Jonathan's the one that came with his armor bearer, and he's like, he went up to the host of the Philistines. Right? Before this, he's saying, hey, we know that God can save by many or by few. Should we go up to these guys? You know, just, just me and you. Come on, let's do it. And they go, and God brings a great victory. Why? Because they were willing. Their heart was in it. They, didn't, they, didn't, they knew they didn't need everyone else. They were like, let's just do this. Let's get moving. We need that confidence. We have story after story. You've got, you've got it all right here. You need help boosting your confidence. Read these stories. Read the Bible. Get in the Word of God. Understand that every single one of these stories is real. And God has used people all throughout history to do great things. And He still wants to do great things and have His great name known in the earth and glorified and magnified. And the way that He's going to do that is by using the least of us. You think you don't have that many talents? It's great. Because then God could use you even more, bring even more glory and honor unto Him. 
If God could take someone who, who I don't really have much of anything to offer God, great. Because then everyone's going to realize what God's capable of doing. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for everything. We can't even list off everything, dear Lord, for everything. We, we love you. God, I pray that you would please strengthen us, strengthen our, our faith. God, it, 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 sometimes it's easy to, to get stirred up when we read your word and when we, and when we see these things, Lord. Um, it's, it's easy to get encouraged and get edified. Help us not to lose the, the edification that we receive tonight. Help us not to lose this faith when maybe the time comes when we're not surrounded by each other to help one another, but, but we end up finding ourselves alone in a battle and, and facing a giant of our own. And it's just us and them. Lord, help us to have that faith, to not back down, to not be ashamed of our faith, to not be ashamed of what you've done for us, but to rather find strength in what you've done and find strength that you'll be with us if, we're make it, if we make the right choice and we stand up and get involved in the spiritual fight that you can do all things, that we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.